Hey, what's up you amazing hackers? I hope you're all doing well today. So quite a few have asked me what my cross-site scripting attack strategy is and it might surprise quite a few of you. It's not what you think and I've seen quite a few people make these mistakes so I hope you can learn from them. Let's get right into them, shall we? So the first mistake I see quite a lot of people make is they go online, they look for cross-site scripting payloads, they copy the first list that they see and they paste it everywhere that they can or they take intruder or something and they just go at it that way and think that they can quite, uh, find quite a lot of uh, cross-site scripting attacks like that. Well, I hate to burst your bubble here, guys, but that's not going to do you quite a lot of good. There is a very high chance that you're going to encounter a duplicate because you're not the only person that can find these lists. So if you want to do this per se, it really helps to find your own list, to create your own list. Now, why do I say this? First of all, 99% of the lists that I see there are purely aimed at HTML injection. That's not how cross-site scripting works, guys. HTML injection is a possibility, a possible entry point for cross-site scripting. But it's not the only way. You see quite a lot of people, uh, quite a lot of lists that list all of these HTML tags, and that's quite good. Of course, you need them as well, but you need to actually understand what you're doing. So my method of fuzzing would be to get just all the special characters that I can find and see if any of those catches or if any of those uh, cause any strange behavior. And then if you see web application filter, your ear should go ringing because web application filters, they often mean that developers are trying to hide something that they weren't able to hide in code and they have to use a web application filter to hide that. So when you see one, try to dig a little bit deeper. That's usually a pretty good sign. Now, another mistake I see quite a lot of people make is they just download XSS Hunter, uh, I'm sorry, not download <laughs> XSS Hunter. I mean XSS Strike, of course, which is uh, a pretty good tool, if you ask me. There's nothing wrong with that tool. But they just go online, they download the first tool that they see, and they try to find cross-site scripting that way. Can you find cross-site scripting that way? Of course, but there is so much chance that it's going to be a duplicate. First of all, of course, all of the parameters, all of the URLs that you feed, it really, really matters that you find hidden parameters. It doesn't matter what tool you run. It matters to some degree that you use the right word list, of course, and that you have to have your own word list, not the one that everybody uses. But if you're able to find some hidden parameters in JavaScript files or wherever, like way back URLs, or just by using the website, maybe, maybe there are, are some hidden fields, you know, it might even help to investigate those. Those are the ways or those are the things that are going to prevent you from getting a duplicate because guys, seriously, everybody knows how to copy and paste an HTML attack factor and see if they get HTML injection. Everybody knows that. But if you fuzz your parameters where you think HTML injection might be possible, where you think cross-site scripting might be possible. I mean, sorry, if you start fuzzing all of your parameters with all of your special characters, you might see that a single or a double quote suddenly breaks something. Now, why might that happen? You might start looking in the JavaScript code. You might notice that that value gets put into the JavaScript code somewhere and it gets put into a double quote, uh, like, like a, a string that could, gets terminated too early that's going to cause some problems, but it might also help you with some JavaScript insertion. And you don't even need, uh, like, uh, you don't even need your 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 HTML tags for that. All you need to do is manipulate that JavaScript a little bit at that moment. And all of these fancy payload lists, all of these fancy attack factors that test for HTML injection. They're 90% are going to miss this because of course they're going to generate an error. But if you don't know what you're doing, and this is the biggest mistake I see people make, they want to start hunting for cross-site scripting when they don't know JavaScript. That's not a good idea, guys. First of all, if you find your attack factor, if you find something that catches, you're going to have to exploit it properly. You're going to have to either steal some cookies or you're going to have to execute some JavaScript function, but you're going to have to do something with that. 
Now, second of all, it's really important, of course, that if you find those things, if you find something that you can exploit, that you also know all of the security mechanisms that hang around those things, like cookies are protected by HTTP flags. You have CSP that's in place at some, uh, at some target. So you have to know all of those properties, all of those protections as well, besides just knowing what the JavaScript is. Now, you don't need to be able to write JavaScript fluently, of course, but it's really important that you're able to read it properly and that you're able to understand what's going on on screen. This is also very important because it's not going to happen that you go to a target quite often. You're going to find JavaScript files that are obfuscated. You're not going to find plain text JavaScript files a lot in the wild, at least if your target knows what they're doing. They're going to obfuscate that JavaScript and it's up to you to de-obfuscate that JavaScript. So that's where some of the CTF tools come in handy as well and some of the CTF uh, skills that you learn there. They're also useful for bug bounty hunting and cross-site scripting. Now one big huge final mistake that I see everybody who goes for cross-site scripting make and there's no exception, even I do this all of the time, when I look for a cross-site scripting and tag factor, I don't start early enough. I just, like all of these parameters that I see, I, I, I'll try and insert my attack factor in there. But it's really important, and this is where integrations come into play, guys. So when you have your application, the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to probably register an account this is where you should try fuzzing with some special characters already and this is what makes it hard because you're going to have to create multiple accounts to be able to create to fuss with most of these special characters that you're going to fuss with why does this matter why is this important because sometimes when you have multiple like multiple accounts it takes a while to create them you guys know how it goes you're hunting on your target you have to create one account another account it takes a while people don't like that it takes a long time um, people don't take the effort to go through that if they want to test something new creating a new account it's sometimes bothersome and i even don't even go through the trouble of doing it but i should and if I really want to test my cross-site scripting attack factor, for example, I want to test something new, I'll edit my account's name instead of creating a new account and trying there. Now, why does this matter? Because the edit endpoint might have some different validations on it than the creation endpoint. So if you really want to test your cross-site scripting attack factor, it's really important that you test it throughout all of the flows of the application. So you create a new account with a new attack factor, you order something new, you see in the invoice if there's something that triggers your attack factor. If it's not, you go through all of the functionalities and if you want to try a new attack factor or if you, if you have some new ideas like instead of HTML injection, maybe you just want to try fuzzing some random parameters. This, like you just create a new account, you just go through the flows again, you create a new account, try to order a new item, try to get a new invoice, but you start over. And of course you can edit them as well, but it's really important that you go through the flows all of the time. Now, why is this so important? You guys might be wondering. It's really simple. All of these flows, it's sort of like automatic testing. You know, you have your cross-site scripting attack factor in there already. And all you have to do is go through them manually, go through these flows manually. And if your uh, attack factor gives you a, a pop-up, you'll know automatically. So you don't have to waste any more time finding these automatic tools. Because guys, really, these automatic tools, they're good and you should run them. Of course, you should run them. But they're not the end-all, be-all. If that's where your story ends, then you're not doing the right thing, in my opinion. You should run them next to your manual testing and start as early as possible. You should insert your cross-site scripting attack factor as soon as you create an account into every single field that you see. And then when you create a new product, again, attack factor. When you create anything new, insert your attack factor 
also try editing them, editing the name, editing the product description, see if that brings you something cool. And don't just leave it to HTML injections, also try JavaScript injections, try doing weird stuff with random parameters. It really helps if you try to understand your application a little bit. And you might be wondering to yourself, Uncle Red, do you really spend all that time reading through all of that JavaScript? And my answer is yes, of course. Why aren't you? That's a freaking gold mine. Go read that JavaScript file, guys. Why are you even watching my videos still? You should be reading JavaScript files. Seriously, for a second, the anatomy of a cross-site scripting attack vector is really, really simple. You have your alert, that's your event that's going to happen. You have to have an event handler, something to trigger that event. If you want that alert on an HTML tag, it's going to be an event handler like uh, on error, on click, on submit. There are different event handlers if you want. You can look at Portswig or Cheat Sheet for that. They have a really good list of all of the event handlers available and also all of the HTML tags where you can possibly do something like that on. So um, you do your event handler, you insert it into your HTML tag and that should be enough. If it's not enough, you can try some more stuff like uh, you can try encoding your payload, you can try putting it in an eval function, you can try so many things because, for example, the eval might not be functioned. And one thing you have to know about cross-site scripting, guys, is often developers will try to block your cross-site scripting attempts by implementing a blacklist filter. Now, if you know anything about blacklist filters, it's that they, if they forget to put anything on the blacklist, that means that we can easily get through. I have a video about cross-site scripting attacks and how you can easily look for them uh, automatically with Burp Intruder and their cheat sheet as well. So I'll put that one up in the corner right here somewhere, should be there right now. So if you guys want to watch that, that's also a pretty good video. Now, as for reflected cross-site scripting, a lot of you guys know what reflected cross-site scripting is. You'll probably go looking for reflected cross-site scripting on search pages, on any parameter that's reflected. But I urge you to really think outside of the box here, guys, because you're not going to find a reflected cross-site scripting on the search page of a website. That's not going to happen. What you have to do is go really, really deep and think, okay, maybe there are some parameters that I'm not seeing. Maybe there are some parameters that I need to do some, some stuff for or read the JavaScript for. Maybe there are some things reflected on error pages, like if I get a 403 page or a 404 page. Maybe there are things reflected if I log in with a strange username, like if say, for example, I use an as a, I log in as a username, the system might say user DXSS rat is not available on the system. I'll have to replace my name DXSS rat with an attack factor and see if I can get some cross site scripting that way. You know, that that's just thinking outside of the box a little bit. There's not going to be quite a lot of impact there, I think. But you never know, of course, so I would really, uh, really urge you guys to just stay curious, stay exploring, and stay freaking amazing. I hope I'll see you guys later. Bye, amazing hackers!